I've I had the honor as uh, a, a staff person of the Georgia Public Policy Foundation to introduce the senator now on this being the third occasion. And it's hard to find the, the accolades sufficient enough to describe his contributions to the state of Georgia and to this organization. And we're for, forever grateful for that. But just let me mention one thing. And again, as with Publix, there is a biographical sketch that details a lot of the senator's accomplishments over his very distinguished career. But this organization, as you all know, is founded on three principles. Devotion to free enterprise, devotion to limited government, and devotion to personal responsibility. Paul Coverdale, probably more than any other politician I can think of, embodies loyalty and devotion to those ideals. Free enterprise, uh, as your bio indicates, the Chamber of Commerce, the National Federation of Businesses, have all bestowed uh, accolades on the senator for his work on behalf of small business people. Limited government, I don't think there was a more vocal spokesman in the entire United States two years ago when there was an effort afoot to, to nationalize our health care system. And Paul Coverdale deserves tremendous credit for that. And personal responsibility, I could go on and on, crime and drugs, violence against women, he's, he's had a number of initiatives that want to restore and geared toward restoring the uh, responsibility of the individual for their welfare. And uh, so I think the, the fit between this organization and the senator is so close that, it, that it's, it's, again, it's hard for me to come up with words to describe my admiration and respect for him. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Senator Paul Coverdale. Thank you, hey, Kathy. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, Carolyn. Well, thank you very much. It's uh, an honor, Griff, to be with you again this morning. I, I, looking around at these tables, uh, it's like a reunion here. Uh, first, I want to take just a moment. I know, Lamar, you have uh, to leave here fairly shortly. And uh, so while you're here, uh, let me thank you for your extended contribution uh, to our government, to our community, to our nation. We had a chance to visit briefly a couple of times uh, since your presidential effort. Uh, you testified uh, in Washington with regard to the morass of uh, political management in our campaign law. I, I do believe that your comments on the election process are among the most intellectual and forward thinking that I've heard, and I hope more and more people uh, will listen to what you're saying about what's happened to the management of our electoral process. And I want to also say that I believe that you've made an enormous contribution to this presidential cycle. Uh, it's an honor to have you here with us, and I, I would hope you would join me in another round of applause. <laughs> And of course, uh, seated here in front of me are my uh, colleagues from the Senate and House and County Commission. And again, my, uh, my deep admiration uh, to those public officials such as yourselves uh, who are at the, at the forefront of community service. And uh, I remember well my days in the State Senate, and I commend you for what you're doing. I think it's an enormous contribution uh, to our community. I, I acknowledge that here this morning. I would like to visit with you, uh, if I might, a little bit about uh, my observations about the American family. We all remember Dan Quayle and uh, the extended debate that he created uh, when he began talking about uh, the American family. Looks at, as though we're finally acknowledging that he maybe had uh, something on the mark when he introduced that debate to us. Well, you know, we, in America, at the end of the day, uh, or at the beginning of the day, you, you, you think of the family of getting the country up in the morning and off to school, um, to work, house America, feed America, get America spiritually ready for the next day. 
for the future. And uh, there have been a lot of comments uh, of late about what's gone wrong. Some people say it's Hollywood. Hollywood's gotten in the way and has messed up our values. Even our uh, nominee has taken a swipe or two at uh, Hollywood. Then there's uh, Bill Marilyn G. Wax down at the uh, Atlanta Constitution. She thinks it's greed. Uh, the American family just can't wait to buy another electric toaster or build a swimming pool out back, another car. And uh, that greed has caused us to work harder and longer and have less to show for it. In my view, there is no institution, none, none that come close to it, not Hollywood, not greed, but government policy. Government policy has had the most profound effect on the behavior of the American family than any institution, bar none. Let's, uh, let's take the war on poverty for a moment. We've spent five and a half trillion dollars, more than the First World War, Second World War, Korea, Vietnam, and the Persian Gulf combined on the war on poverty and lost it. Some people, I believe, think that the inner city ghetto is a product of flawed human nature. Uh, that somehow these people that have been gathered into these housing projects, crime-infested centers, ghettos, got there singularly of their own motivation and concept of life. That is simply not true. Government policy created the urban city ghetto. Government policy created it. We made distribution centers of intellectual walk-ins, wonkism, out of our cities. We made them distribution centers for a concept of dependency. And we've created armies of poor. Every data that we set out to correct, or they set out to correct, are worse today than when we began, with the exception of one, infant mortality. Other than that, it is a total disaster. Illegitimacy, SAT scores, crime, and the list goes on. I've wondered, Lamar, in generations to come, when history uh, writes about these policies and what we've done to these millions upon millions of Americans in terms of their stunted opportunities, lost horizons, what history will say of this disaster. I don't think it's going to be a very pretty chapter as you analyze the policies, the federal policies that created the urban inner city ghetto. You could almost do anything differently and be better for it. What leaves my jaw dropping is the defense of the status quo. We've heard in Washington that uh, everybody agrees that it ought to be changed, but I had to fend off, along with colleagues, amendment after amendment coming from the other side whose total goal was to leave it as it is. And they call that compassion. How in the world could anybody 
look at what's happening to our children in these inner city ghettos and fight to defend that system is beyond me. It's beyond me. The most compassionate, caring citizen would be totally dedicated to disrupting and shutting down this system and beginning anew. Well, what about, uh, we've, we've, we hear a lot about this community. We focus a great deal on it. You've all read most of the statistics that I've mentioned here briefly. But you don't hear a whole lot about the families from which we took the five and a half trillion dollars. You hear a lot about the families for which we directed this war on poverty, but you don't read nor talk much about the families that put up the armament, who gave the five and a half trillion. And I would argue that we have altered their behavior and we have, we have intruded on their established priorities and we have made them in a great case dysfunctional just as the other group we were targeted on. Now let me talk about that for a minute. The average family today in Georgia earns between forty and $45,000. Both parents now work, and they have two kids. By the time the federal government marches through their checking account, and the state government, and the local government, and they pay their share of the higher interest because of the national debt, and Social Security, and Medicare, and their cost of our regulated burden society, they only have 48.2% left of their wages. Lord Thomas Jefferson, if he were here today, would be stunned. You know what one of the ironies is? This year, the first day that that family got to keep the first dime of their wages was July 4th took on a new meaning this year. <laughs> that a family would work from January 1st to July 3rd before it got to keep the first dime for its own dreams, its own aspirations, more importantly, its own responsibilities. I, I went back to 1950 and took a look at the tax burden that uh, I often talk about Ozzie and Harriet. Now, some people here uh, don't remember that quintessential family, but some of us do. Ozzie was sending two cents to the federal government. If he were here today, he'd be sending a quarter. And if you track the tax burden on this average family, and compare it to the number of these families for which two parents have to work, you will not be surprised that that line is virtually identical to the tax line on the graph. In other words, every time we jacket it up, what that middle class family had to send to Washington or the state capitol to do uh, some wizard's priorities, a new, a new batch of mothers had to go into the workplace. Only 2% of them were in the workplace when Ozzie was around, but 70% of them are in the workplace today. Now you're going to say, well, that's because we modified the glass ceiling. And you're, you're, that's correct. But 85% of the, 
of these working mothers don't like what they're having to do. One-third of them wouldn't be there at all. One-third of them only want to work as volunteers. And one-third of them only want to be a volunteer in the workplace. So Uncle Sam and federal policy didn't just let her go into the workforce. We pushed her into the workforce. Savings. Are you going to be surprised that savings have collapsed in this middle-income family? That they're virtually non-existent? That they're not preparing for their retirement? What is left to save after somebody's tromped through your house and taken half of what you've got? Nothing. There's nothing to save. Are you surprised that credit card debt is at the highest level it's ever been? in our history, consumer debt staggeringly high, or that the typical family has downsized itself, or that there are more latchkey children at home alone without guidance. And Marilyn thinks it's a toaster. Government policy has had an untold and profound effect on the behavior of America and its family and its core and its government policy. It is not our people. We are a great people. We are entrepreneurial. We are flexible. We are problem solvers. But we have a big government sitting on our backs. And something damn well better be done about it. <clears throat> what about the future? When you, when you contemplate where we are, and you, have, you begin to think about the future. I've, I've just, I guess, coming out of San Diego I, and uh, watching Ted Koppel and company uh, talk about, uh, I was on the platform committee, how hard-edged it is and all that sort of thing. When you think that it will require a child born today, Hank, a child born today with no modification in our policies will forfeit 84% of its lifetime wages in order to support this system, this state that we put in place. 84%. A child born today will pay $187,000 on interest payments alone for the national debt that we have left that child. I was speaking uh, several weeks ago, several months ago now, at Ebenezer Baptist Church. Uh, it was the occasion of Martin Luther King's uh, birthday. And uh, I was reminded that here we were in a nation whose birth was dedicated and committed to freedom. Uh, celebrating the life of a man committed to freedom. And uh, the thought came to me, any generation, any generation engaged in the practice of consuming the resources of the future is engaged in the abrogation of freedom. 
the denial of freedom for somebody else. And as sure as Thomas Jefferson said it, it is true, it is wrong. And it is uniquely wrong in our society, built on, cared for, committed to freedom. If we are truly a compassionate people, and I believe we are, then the goal of breaking the back of a system whose only goal is dependency in our inner cities is correct and worthwhile and laudatory. And the pursuit of policy that leaves the resources and wages of families and workers with those who earned it so that they might do the things they choose to do about their lives and so that they can fulfill their responsibilities to themselves and to their family and to this great nation is correct and compassionate and caring. And anyone who has had the opportunity to be an American citizen and enjoy and be enriched by freedom, by being free, by being free to make one's own choices, to pursue one's own goals, must be deeply grievous and worried and concerned about the future. We are perilously close to being the first generation of Americans to be engaged in the denial rather than protection of freedom for those who would follow us here. We have placed before our future generations a burden that is almost insurmountable and the effect of which would be to cripple this, the greatest democracy in the history of the world. So I would just say to all those who reflect on that which we do, breaking dependency, freeing our families and communities, and protecting future generations from obligation for which they cannot bear is laudatory, is correct, and is the American way. And anybody that will stand with me to pursue those goals, come on board. We need you. God bless you all. God bless the United States of America. Very kind. Thank you. Thank you. Griff, am I supposed to turn this over, or are you going to have a moment for questions and answers? Do you want to open for questions? I think Senator Dole's tax package ought to be the centerpiece of the fall campaign. I'm very pleased that he has chosen to put it there, and it comes exactly to the point I was just trying to talk about, because it is dedicated to relieving the pressure 
on the middle and working family of America. And Lord knows we need it. Uh, as I said, uh, they are already forfeiting over half their income. This is not a total, uh, the, plan, the plan doesn't get us back to where we need to be, but it's moving in the right direction. It's absolutely correct policy. And there'll be some people in the room here who will argue, and I hear it all the time, that first we have to deal with the deficit. My response is, uh, they are not mutually exclusive. We have to reduce uh, the burden on these working families. And we have to deal with the deficit and we have to do it simultaneously. We've dug, we've dug a huge hole. We've demonstrated in the 104th Congress that you can balance the budget, you can do it prudently and wisely, and you can lower taxes. They have to be done simultaneously. I do not agree uh, that, we, that uh, we have to keep middle America in the hole that it's in while we work out the deficit that we've been building up over the last 30 years. I think he's right on target. Yes, sir. Well, first, uh, you make, let me deal with the contract. The contract, I think, among party regulars was a tool and a discipline that brought them together. It was the appropriate focus for a congressional uh, election. Uh, actually, if you, most Americans, uh, were not focused on, quote unquote, the contract. It was more of a process and a system internally, and a good one, because it, it, it caused all of our candidates to be on message, on the same song sheet, as it were. Um, this election is probably not going to be, quote unquote, a nationalized election. Uh, it's going to be more member to member. And that's maybe good for us. I think one of the strongest tools we have in this election uh, is a member on the ground in his or her district trying to tell the, the truth about what's happening in Washington. One of the dilemmas of this election, uh, and the speaker and I were talking about this several months ago, is that both campaigns are saying similar things. Uh, now almost uh, uh, the brunt of many jokes as uh, uh, even the nominee wondered when President Clinton was going to come to San Diego. So uh, it's just a different dynamic and a different process as you go into the election. I would argue too that the 94 elections as much as anything were driven by the health care debate and the big government uh, nature that surrounded the Clinton administration. It really defined him going into the 94 election. And he's run from that. Uh, so we have a new issue to deal with as we come into the 96 election. I doubt that you will see the framing of quote unquote a contract. Further complexity is it is a presidential election and whenever you're in a presidential election, the tone of it and the structure of it, for better or for worse, is designed by the presidential nominee. And uh, to try to alter that or modify it uh, is extremely difficult to do and probably not a wise thing to do. Uh, if you noticed in the convention, there's been media speculation about the lower profile of Speaker Gingrich. I think he was absolutely correct. Uh, he, 
he did not want to distract uh, from the nominees convention. And when you look at the way that uh, convention was structured, I think it was a home run, uh, maybe two of them. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, let me say that uh, first, uh, the, the, the change, and we're speaking very forthrightly about it, is that when you have a Republican president and a Republican Congress, you really do create change. And not only will we move the popular tax reductions through, but we will deal with spending as well. And uh, uh, the Reagan presidency was able to produce the tax reduction, but he was unable uh, to produce the spending reductions that need to, need to go hand in hand with it. A Republican Congress, a Republican President are going to do that. You're going to have, you're going to produce a balanced budget. You're going to probably have a balanced budget amendment to the Constitution. So there, there's an entirely different dynamic here because we are talking about a control of the government. White House, House, and Senate and the kind of changes that come from it. Can you keep uh, the trickle-down criticism from emanating from certain members of the press? Probably not. But I think we just have to keep telling our story and telling the effect of a balanced budget, which 90% of Americans agree with, and, 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 and stay on it, because Americans agree with this. In fact, if you take the top 10 issues uh, before the American people today, the Republicans are on target in seven out of ten of them. And so uh, I just think we have to keep m making our case. The, uh, frankly, the toughest thing we've dealt with uh, so far is that it's something that's really out of our control. We had a long, very difficult summer, and it's because our resources were depleted in the pursuit of the primary, theirs were not, uh, they have an unfettered ally in the AFL-CIO, putting anywhere from 50 to two, I hear every figure in the world, uh, millions of dollars into the election. This is the Alamo for them. They've got to try to regain the Congress. I don't think they're going to make it. Uh, they're spending millions and millions of dollars. For all summer, it was a little bit, it reminded me of like standing uh, in Europe and throwing rocks uh, at uh, the Panzers. Uh, now we're on a, li a little bit of an equal playing field. We're both funded at about the same level, and I think you're going to start seeing a change. In the I think we can speak better to our case. We were pretty muffled during the summer. We just ran out of resources. Yes, Reverend.
We're going to be in this debate for a long time about welfare. I mean, after all, we have uh, spent 40 years building the current system uh, and creating, as I alluded to earlier, a virtual national disaster. Um, the fundamental decision to send and the management of welfare back to the states is a core and correct decision because you are putting people uh, making the decisions closer and more timely uh, to the issues that develop as we alter this vast system. One of the pieces that I think is talked about all too little is that one of the generators in terms of employment we underestimate the fiber of people. Once it's clear that there are finite, there's finite support and then it stops, what we're underestimating is the energy that will erupt when one is confronted with having to have a job and not being able to just count on someone else. And that energy is vastly, that story is vastly untold in the change of welfare. Secondarily, there will be, and there are built into the reform, uh, education components uh, in an effort to transition people and prepare them. But I would contend that it's not the government rule, not the government system that's built into even the transition that the key will be the genesis that comes from people that know that they are going to have to move out on their own and become a part of our society. And we underestimate them, and ha the entire system has traditionally underestimated the fiber of the people directly involved. With regard to foreign investment, I don't think I have to make this point uh, too often here, but, but foreign uh, aid, has become almost a non-existent component of our federal government. Uh, if you ask Americans, what are we investing in foreign aid, most of them think it's the largest expenditure we make. It's less than 1%. It's 8 tenths of 1% and going down. Now, the real genesis of foreign participation in our economy, and we better have it given the condition we're in, but is the fact that we are selling so much debt, and that is what introduces more foreign investment in our country than any single policy that we're making. Charlie, I'm going to take yours as the last question. It's justified. I would say, <laughs> that eight out of 10 people who come to my office today, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what they do anymore. It used to be just business people. But you can be running a university, a school system, or a small or large business. I almost could give them a form with just the blanks. You put in your name and where you live and the phone number because everything else is the same. They are talking about a government that's too intrusionary. They are talking about a government that acts like a bully. They are talking about a government that is inflexible. They are talking about a government that is in the way of their attempts to do that which is their mission. And it doesn't matter where they come from. A unique new phenomena is they will often just whisper to me as if they might be overheard. And they are fearful. And as a result, there are too many successful entrepreneurs who cash out. Now, not that the, not that the capital is lost, 
but the, but the mind is. And the energy. And the new ideas. And that is a byproduct of a bully government, which ought to be a partner, not a bully. And uh, it's justified. You all have been awfully patient with me this morning, and I appreciate it greatly. God bless you in what you do. Thank you.